All right, so what I would like to cover first, uh, look at suicide statistics in general, right, using a multi-system approach, and then suicide and infection, psychoimmunology of suicide, and then suicide and Lyme disease, suicide and Magellan's, and then uh, summarize things. So basic question I'd like to address today is, is there an association between Margellan's disease and suicide? And if there is, how can it be explained? How extensive is this association? And what can we do to prevent it? So although morbidity and disability with Margellan's has been described by many, mortality has never been methodically studied. Suicide and Margellan patients have occurred. Both suicide and accidental overdoses have occurred and cause considerable, considerable morbidity and mortality. Many suicides associated with Morgellons are not formally documented as such. Colleagues, including some of you in the audience, have documented that some Morgellons patients have committed suicide recently. So now we're going to do the most sophisticated study ever done on the uh, occurrence of suicide with Morgellons patients. And this is the only study that will ever be done so far. So first of all, I wanted a head count of how many are in this survey so I can figure out percentage. So if someone could figure out the number in the room and add that up, okay? 48. Everyone in the room that would be taking the survey, okay? And then I'll ask three questions. We have, we have 48 people here. 48, okay. How, how many of you asked suicide, asked Magellan's patients about suicidality? And a show of hands would, the number of people actually ask about it, okay, out of the 48, okay? Meaning have considered it? Have considered. How many of us have considered Yes, have considered it at some point in the course of their illness. Who have not even asked Lyme, uh, Margellan's patients about it. How many of you, I'm looking at whether you, you even asked the question or not. Yes. So okay. we should be looking to know how many of us have actually considered suicide due to this disease. Okay, let's start with hands of people who have considered. Have, have not asked, not, not considered, have, have even asked the question. Yeah, do, is it even part of your workup? Do you ever ask Margellan's patients, have you ever been suicidal ever? I want to know how many of you even asked that question or not. Physicians, yeah. or, or anyone taking the survey, okay? I'll tell you what, there's confusion on this. Let's move on to the next question. All right? Okay. How many of you know someone with Margellans who has been suicidal? Let's see a show of hands for that question. We have a big show of hands. Okay, so for the people who have their hands up right now, all the, can I get a show of hands from the people who have it? That'll be easier to count. Okay. How many of you know someone who's been suicidal or has Morgellons? And since it seems like most of you raised your hand, yes. it's more the question of how many of you have never known someone with Morgellons who was ever suicidal? Yes. 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 Yes.
748, okay. And then the next question is, how many of you know of someone with Morgellons who has committed suicide? Five and forty-eight. Okay. All right. So that's the most sophisticated survey ever done on Margellans and suicide. Okay. So now let's move on. Okay. And now we can quote that. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, now I'm going to talk some about suicide statistics. So suicide is not equally distributed throughout the world. In America, we're kind of in the middle zone. Red is the higher amount. Yellow is middle. Blue is a lower amount. And if we look at um, suicide in the United States, you see a higher incidence in the mountain states. Uh, it's hard to explain that. Maybe there's more people working with animals. Now, with a condition like Morgellons, it doesn't affect the large numbers of suicide. It, it, this maybe isn't very useful, but, but it's just good to know that there's epidemiological patterns to suicide. Uh, quite different than homicide, where you see differences with homicide, where there's a high incidence, let's say, in Louisiana. Now, looking at suicide statistics, it's the tenth leading cause of death for all ages, and this is 2016. So in 2016, 45,000 committed suicide. That's 13 per 100,000, 123 suicides per day, one suicide every 13 minutes. Yeah, it should be up. It's, it's not up. Wait a minute. Um, um, <coughs> let me get back to do that, okay? I'm not sure why it's not showing. Okay, so uh, plus sign. And then... Um, let me see. Share screen. Okay. And then let me see if this works now. Does that work? Okay. Okay, I'm going to go back to some of the other slides. So those were statistics. That's the global statistic. And then America with the suicide belt in the Western states. Then uh, comparing it to homicide. And then this was the where I left off. So uh, a significant number of suicides are associated with uh, consumption of alcohol and opioids and also and and also being on antidepressants. And suicide results in a cost of uh, 69 billion in combined uh, cost per year. Now, with suicide deaths, uh, the greater number is firearms, followed by poisoning, suffocation, and other methods. So if you look at suicidality, there's different degrees of suicidality. And a very mild degree is just passing thoughts. Uh, or recurrent thoughts, and then preoccupations, or plans, wealth, and then impulses, attempts, well-planned attempts, versus completed suicide. Now, for instance, someone who's very suicidal may attempt more than one method at once. For example, one person who took an overdose, stood on a ledge of a building, and shot himself in the head with a gun. That was a very serious suicide attempt as compared to someone who makes a dramatic gesture and takes three pills. Suicidality, uh, there's, there's these different ratios, and I'll, this is relevant because it helps with statistics. So about nine million adults um, reported having suicidal thoughts. 
whereas only 2.7 million actually had plans and 1.3 million actually made attempts. Now, this was in 2014, this was based when, when there were 43,000 suicides. The numbers keep drifting up before I said 2016, which was 45. So when we look at this, there's a ratio of, uh, based on that, that 0.3% of those of suicidal thoughts actually commit suicide. And I'll get back to this later when I'm calculating some of the statistics. Now, self-harm is different. So about 500,000 people are visit a hospital for self-harm injuries. So that's 12 self-harm attempts for every death by suicide. However, the way su these statistics are collected, it does not separate the difference between intentional self-harm versus accidental self-harm. Gender disparities, about 80% of suicides are males, whereas females are more likely than males to have suicidal thoughts. So it's the seventh leading cause of death for males and the 14th leading cause of death for females. Firearms is the most common method of uh, in males and poisoning is the most common in females. Uh, there's uh, people go on the internet now and they look at suicidal techniques and there's all these websites of how to commit suicide and there's suicide kids that people die. So if we try to understand suicide, it's a complicated process. So we have to look at how it evolves over time and what are the contributors, triggers, and, and deterrents to suicidality. So looking at that like time and space, and I'm using a model with infectious disease. So there's these predisposing and precipitating factors. Then there's some infection or some other trigger, an immune reaction, some physiology contributing and psychodynamic process leading to dysfunction, leading to impairment. And then when there's ineffective treatment, the risk keeps increasing over time. So there's these contributors to suicide versus deterrence. It's a balance. And this is a good way to look at it with this formula. There's contributors and then failed deterrence and acute triggers that can make someone suicidal. Now, breaking it down into more details, there's a long list of contributors of, uh, and then there's the triggering events and the deterrence. Uh, in general, uh, lack of pleasure life or pain are some of the uh, contributors. And um, the triggering events, like the window of fear, ex example is, you get bad news and you don't know what the final outcome and person's brain imagines the worst. That's a high risk period of time. And then there's the deterrence if you have purpose, meaning something that you're connected to socially. So if we look at the risk factors, I'll break it down into the terrible AIDS. Anhedonia is a big risk factor. People don't necessarily kill themselves because of pain, but more so lack of pleasure in life. A person can have a huge amount of pain and adversity in their life, but if they have purpose and meaning, they'll tolerate. The person who gets no pleasure from life, uh, who, who doesn't feel any kind of connection, they're a particularly high risk. So that's anhedonia, lack of pleasure in life, which the other things in a terrible A's are abulia, lack of will, apathy, a lack of initiative, energy, a lack of energy, alexithymia, an inability to identify one's own feelings, anorexia, lack of appetite, uh, or lack of social, uh, sexual interest, asocial, or then the other, uh, altruistic suicides, where there's the feeling other people would be better off without me. So suicide and infections, that's an interesting area. Now, there's, it's called the manipulation hypothesis. And the idea there is that Parasites manipulate the host in a manner that helps propagate the parasite. And therefore, there's a lot of evidence with this that parasites can make host behavior different, be they more aggressive or more easily victimized. That's a theory, particularly with uh, toxoplasmosis. Where if a mouse is more vulnerable to manipulation, it helps propagate the reproduction uh, 
when they're preyed upon. And um, so, or, or if they're more predatorial, that may propagate. Now, in some of these infections, we may be a dead end host and this doesn't apply, but there's a lot of models uh, explain this Darwinian evolutionary theory of uh, the manipulation hypothesis. Now, one study that was quite interesting in um, Denmark, they have this large database, 8 million patients, everybody in the country, and they found that hospitalization for infection increased the risk of suicide. So at first they looked at chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and, um, and it could bring out suicide with someone who had no history. So now we're looking at more of a physiological cause rather than a psychological cause. And then looking at that further, uh, they looked and found that uh, if someone um, was recently hospitalized with an infection, the more recent the infection, and the more severe the infection, the more the likelihood of committing suicide. And uh, there was a very high correlation that with a p-value of 0 0.001. Then they went on to look at, at that further and realized that people with chronic infections, uh, particularly HIV, AIDS, uh, they had a very high risk of suicide. And um, so, Severity, proximity, and chronicity of infection correlated with risk of suicide. Then, but how can this be explained? And we have to look at the psychoimmunology to try to explain it. So there's quite a number of articles, and these are only a few, and there's some more, explaining this link between the psychoimmunology uh, basis of, with suicide. So, person gets an infection, then that provokes the immune system, and then I somehow contribute to suicide risk. So in looking at that, let's look at different things and try to pull it together. This is one study where quinolone treatment correlated strongly with suicide. And there's something specific about quinolone antibiotics that brings out suicidality, and there's speculation maybe that the NMDA receptor or GABA and that I'm gonna to get to in a little bit more detail. So adding it up, when we not only do infections correlate suicide, but so does anti-infective treatment. Now maybe this could be explained as a result of the, the Herxheimer reaction. So that when you treat an infection and you get an immune system flare, so there's that increased immune activity which correlates with suicidality. Even antiretroviral treatment correlates with that. And, and then we also see the study that I mentioned before about suicidality with antibiotic treatment. Now, another related issue that's always puzzled psychiatry is antidepressants, although they reduce suicide, every now and then in young people, we see this increased suicidal risk. So one, possibility is, well, maybe it's a Herxheimer reaction, maybe something else. Now, what, what makes young people different? Now, young people have a more robust immune system. And when you think of it, um, if I start an antidepressant in someone who's 70, th there's going to be more of an, a neurotransmitter effect compared to an immune effect. Psych meds have both immune and neurotransmitter effects. But when I start that same antidepressant, in a young teenager, then there's gonna, they have a more robust immune system. They will have more of an immune effect in comparison to the neurotransmitter effect, which may be opposite of the neurotransmitter effect. That's what I think best explains it. Right? Now, uh, suicide and Lyme disease, right? Now, why do people with Lyme disease commit suicide? Now, this was a survey that was done with the support group, and the answer was hopelessness by lack of educated doctors, isolation, debilitating symptoms, feeling like a burden, and Lyme causing depression and watching our friends die. That was the answer of that survey. Now, I did a survey of Lyme and suicide, and in it, I looked at inactive charts and 43% suicidal. And um, let me show the statistics there. A lot reported depression, 
So this was a chart. Now, I, I evaluated 253 charts. By the way, this is a larger study than all the NIH studies on Lyme disease combined, okay, of 253 patients. So of that, a significant percent were suicidal, and some were suicidal and homicidal. No one was homicidal without being also suicidal. And a lot had explosive anger, uh, which came as a physiological result of the infection. And these people did not have these symptoms before infection. So in looking at it, looking at this whole idea of Lyme and suicidality, there are multiple case reports and other references demonstrating a causal association between suicide risk and Lyme. There really are a lot of articles. Suicide risk is greater in outdoor workers and veterans, both with greater exposure to Lyme or tick-borne disease. And multiple studies demonstrated many infections and the associated pro-inflammatory, cytokine, inflammatory mediated, and metabolic changes, and quinolinic acid changes and glutamate changes alter normal circuitry function, which increases suicidality. So not only is that seen with other infections, but it's also seen with Lyme disease, that same pathophysiology, like I was discussing with uh, the Danish work. So suicidality contributes to causing a number of previously unexplained suicides in Lyme disease, contributes to causing a, a, a number of significant previously unexplained suicides, and is associated with immune-mediated and metabolic changes resulting in psychiatric and other symptoms, which are possibly intensified by negative attitudes about Lyme disease from others. Since Lyme suicides are associated with being overwhelmed by multiple debilitating symptoms and others are impulsive, bizarre, they're invariably impulsive, bizarre, and unpredictable. So by indirect calculations, and that's the ratio that I'm referred to, I calculate about 1,200 suicides are attributable to Lyme per year in America. And um, we need to get a more direct method, and it's suggested that medical examiners, CDC, and others evaluate this and keep better statistics on it. I haven't seen that happen yet. In a chart review, patients with a higher level of risk were seen as having a number of symptoms acquired as a result of Lyme disease. These included hallucinations, explosive anger, dissociative episodes, paranoia, disinhibition, intrusive images, rapid cycling mood changes, mood swings, panic disorder, depersonalization, substance abuse, hypervigilance, generalized anxiety, uh, GI symptoms, chronic pain, depression, low frustration tolerance. So the more of that person acquires as a part of Lyme, the more likely they are to be suicidal. And um, there is a correlation between suicide and depression. And um, there's, although in a general population there's an incidence of depression, it's much greater in the Lyme disease population. And this goes back to early studies by Logigian and Steer back in 1990. And interesting, Leo Shea had the exact same number of depression in his study. And other studies with more selective psychiatric population, like the study I did, show a higher percent with depression. Now, intrusive symptoms are part of suicidality. And a lot of times people don't volunteer this because it's weird, but when I ask people proactively, it comes up. So there's these intrusive, and this goes along with temporal lobe inflammation. So there's this, it's almost like you're clipping on a, a preview for a cheap horror movie and it just comes. And one person described that as gory, unreal, like in a horror story, faces with blood or exaggerated, off expressions, visions of stabbing or killing, often close to you, um, and fleeting faces of the worst possible situation. And, and her quote was, these images don't seem to necessarily be associated with a particular occasion, place, or time, but come and invade the privacy of my mind. So it could be an intrusive image, thought, or emotion. 
Now, I did a study on this, and when I looked at intrusive symptoms, and there I, I looked at 131 cases, um, and 45, 34% had intrusive symptoms. And um, the people that had that had a higher correlation with being suicidal, also with being homicidal. So intrusive symptoms particularly correlate with inflammatory markers. And particularly when you look at that, there's inflammation in the amygdala and hippocampus. And uh, so that seems to be the connection, that you get the infection, it causes increased immune activity that impacts the temporal lobe, that causes these intrusive symptoms, uh, and that's one pathway contributing to uh, suicidality. It's very similar to post-traumatic stress disorder. And there's this, but it's almost like post-traumatic stress disorder without trauma. But when you get post-traumatic stress disorder and this immune process, then it, you're looking at double jeopardy. It makes things worse. So inadequately treated Lyme causes intrusive symptoms. And that can be part of what contributes. And it correlates with this increased inflammation in the temporal lobe. It correlates with higher markers inflammatory markers. And uh, certainly being attentive to this in war veterans is a big issue. And uh, looking at antibiotic treatment can help, but you have to be careful about the Herbsheimer reaction. So this is a physiology of, of suicide. Now, normally we have tryptophan, which is an essential amino acid, and it's converted to serotonin and melatonin. That's a good thing, we want that. But when, when we're in a state of inflammation, chronic inflammation, a enzyme called IDO is increased, and that shifts towards production of quinolinic acid. Quinolinic acid is a neurotoxin that increases suicidal risk. So rather than serotonin and melatonin, which are good, instead we get quinolinic acid in a state of chronic inflammation. And that result, what I call the death form. So we get Lyme or some other infection, persistent inflammation that causes this inflammatory cytokine storm. And the cytokines do penetrate into the blood brain barrier, even if the infection is in the body rather than the brain. We get increased quinolinic acid, which is an NMDA receptor agonist that alters glutamate activity, causes dysfunction, and makes someone suicidal, sometimes homicidal. That's the death point. Now, going back, the Greeks referred to this as thantos, where there would be a death drive. And, and Freud looked at the death drive, trying to understand it. I think this is a physiology behind it. So how common is Lyme and suicide? Now, when I did those ratios that I spoke about before, and looked at how many Lyme cases are there per year, what percent um, chronic, and then looking at what's the ratio of uh, post-treatment Lyme with suicidal ideation, and there's different, I'm quoting a bunch of different studies to come up with this, and suicidal ideation versus suicide, so that ended up in 1,200 suicides a year from Lyme, and uh, a lot of attempts, and I think only a very small number of those are actually identified as Lyme cases. A lot go under the radar and people aren't connecting the dots. Now, another part of this is opioid and substance abuse. When I was talking about anhedonia and lack of purpose, lack of meaning, no pleasure from life, that not only makes someone at risk for suicide, it also makes someone at risk for substance abuse. And uh, because they're not getting pleasure from anything, so they, they're more prone to do extreme risky things, be it gambling, uh, overeating, or substance use. So. Lyme can also cause chronic pain, chronic anxiety. And then people self-medicate, particularly when they're uh, blocked from other avenues of treatment. And then they become dependent with drug-seeking behavior, a lot of clonopin, hypnotics, alcohol, benzos, pain management, pain meds, marijuana, and then some die from overdoses. I think this is a significant area. So a typical case could be like this. Um, 
The person was never diagnosed by their pediatrician, so it may be a young person, and I've seen this play out a number of times. Then they go to late stage disease because the diagnosis was mixed. They have chronic pain, be anhedonia or psychic pain or physical pain. They th then go on to put on pain meds, uh, they order prescriptions, go to multiple physicians, get it from the internet, multiple pharmacies, and go on different benzos, uh, get some of these things by mail order. Uh, then they are not always honest with what they share with different doctors. They get drugs from illegal sources. Then they may do better for a short period of time. And now their tolerance to opioids diminished. Then they have a fight with their girlfriend, boyfriend, and then they relapse. And now they take the dose they used to take, which is now an overdose. And now they're discovered dead from an overdose. So now let's look specifically at Magellan's disease. I asked the patient, uh, you know, well, how so sad are you recently? And they said, well, I feel, and this is someone who really was very self-conscious of their appearance. I feel repulsed from what oozes out of me. I am self-conscious about my lesions. It ruins my clothes. I used to wear very good clothing. I don't look right. I feel like pig pen uh, from Charlie Brown. A lot of people identify with different characters in the media, like uh, Spock and uh, Asperger people identify with Spock or, or uh, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh or uh, Tigger, the Nomadic. So if I didn't have children, I would kill myself. Now that's one of the parents there. So it, what happens when your children grow up? So if you have purpose, meaning, connection, social connection, that is a significant parent, even if you have a lot of these symptoms. So suicide and chronic illness. This is a recent article, and this is quite interesting, and he quoted my study, uh, suicide is a major cause of death in many chronic illnesses where physical and emotional challenges persist. Physical illnesses and functional disability are known risk factors for suicide. Increased risk of suicide has also been found in younger persons diagnosed with POTS, chronic fatigue, fibro, and Lyme. The interpersonal theory of suicide may be relevant to chronic illness community. This theory proposes that people would increase risk for suicide if they experience perceived burdensomeness, the perception that they are a liability to those around them, and thwarted belongings, the perception they do not belong in a social group. For those who are disabled and unable to work or go to school, loss of social interaction can increase isolation and loneliness. So all those things added together. So that feeling of social disconnection is a big issue there. So if we look at theories about what makes someone uh, suicidal with an invisible or visible illness, part is look at psychological and then physical, physiological. Psychological is the isolation and feeling of abandonment from family, friends, employers, insurance companies, and healthcare system. Um, I guess we see some of that with McDonald's, we see it with Lyme. We see quite a bit of it. Uh, and then the physiological, issues that I described, which is the depression, other comorbid psychiatric conditions, the chronic pain, substance use. And then I think particularly significant is the immune changes and the neurotransmitter effects associated with suicidality. So all that added together, increasing suicidal risk. So then people go to their friends and they say, uh, could you give me some advice? And this is the typical advice the person gets uh, get over it, snap out of it, it's all in your head, get off the pity pot, you're just weak-willed, uh, just push myself, pull yourself up by your bootstrap, and that usually doesn't help someone very much. So when we look at, let's say, things more specific with um, Morgellons, the psychological contributors uh, can include um, a feeling, feeling awful, feeling unheard, and telling symptoms are delusional, um, that your symptoms are imaginary, your symptoms are self-inflicted, they're psychosomatic, um, you're and then there's distress dealing with the multiple symptoms that are part of this illness, visibly apparent and potentially stigmatizing symptoms, the lesions, 
the fear of the illness can be contagious, guilt and feeling like a burden, that's a burden, this, um, a lack of understanding and negative views of the condition on the part of family, friends, physicians, and others, insurance companies, others in the healthcare system, losing work, losing family, and losing friends. So all that can add up. So multiple uh, studies link many infections, pro-inflammatory cytokines, tryptophan, metabolism, quinolinic acid, and glutamate mediated physiology with increased risk of suicide. So that's uh, the physiological part. In addition, Morgellons patients may acquire a number of neuropsychiatric symptoms that collectively can increase suicidal risk. And these symptoms can include the cognitive impairments, fatigue, sleep disorders, depression, anhedonia, the lack of pleasure of life, low frustration tolerance, generalized anxiety, social anxiety that can contribute to isolation, magnify it, hypervigilance, panic attacks, depersonalization, paranoia, intrusive symptoms, mood swings, explosive anger, chronic pain, formications, and uh, substance abuse. So delays in diagnosis and treatment lead to disease progression and further increase the risk of morbidity and suicide. In contrast, earlier diagnosis, combined treatment with antibiotics and psychotropics, other treatments to reduce symptoms, a better understanding of the disease process, better understanding of the pathophysiology of suicidality in Regellans, um, and screening for suicidal risk, reduction of stigma, better research in the area can decrease the risk of morbidity and mortality in patients with Regellans. Now, if you recall back uh, in 2013, there were three cardiac deaths from Lyme disease, and this got national attention and all the media hopped on this, and why is there that kind of attention with the suicidality? There's certainly more than three suicides uh, per year with uh, Lyme disease and Regellans, but uh, it's for some reason doesn't get the attention swept under the rug in uh, some scientific communities and, and in the media. So how do we prevent suicide associated with Regellans? If we better recognize the significance and the validation of Mergellans, having earlier diagnosis and treatment, better understanding the pathophysiology of suicide, studies to assess the risk of suicide in Mergellans patients, one of which we just did, screening for suicidal risk in Mergellans patients, and preventing a sense of burdensomeness, thwarted belongingness, and isolation and a combined treatment with antibiotics and psychotropics for psychiatric symptoms. That can help. So in conclusion, suicide is a major and potentially preventable health problem that needs greater attention. Although morbidity and disability with Margellus disease have been described by many, mortality has never been methodically studied. Suicides in Margellus patients Occurred, and both suicide and accidental overdoses may cause considerable mortality. Suicide is a result of an interaction of multiple known and unknown contributors, acute triggers, and failed deterrence. Multiple studies link many infections, pro-inflammatory cytokines, tryptophan metabolism, quinolinic acid, and glutamate-mediated physiology with an increased risk of suicide. Herxheimer reactions, antibiotic treatment, and initiating SSRI treatment and use, an anti-suicidal effect of ketamine, share our common immune quinolinic acid and glutamate mediated physiology. I'll just say a few words about uh, ketamine. Ketamine opposes, um, it's an antagonist uh, at, the, at the NMDA site. So it does the opposite that inflammation does and quinolinic acid does. And that has a rapid, rapid suicide dissipating effect. So it makes sense. And uh, there's a lot of interest in, a, in, psych in psychiatry for acute treatment of suicide risk. Suicidal risk is recognized with Lyme disease, which is frequently seen in association with Magellan's disease. The contributors that collectively increase suicidal risk include an immune-provoked pathophysiology, a lack of understanding and native 
views of the condition on the part of patients, family, friends, physicians, and others in the healthcare system. Guilt and fear is being a burden. That's that burden to visibly apparent and potentially stigmatizing symptoms. Fear the illness can be contagious. Cognitive impairments, fatigue, sleep disorders, depression, anhedonia, low frustration tolerance, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, hypervigilance, panic attacks, depersonalization, paranoia, intrusive symptoms, mood swings, explosive anger, chronic pain, formication, and substance abuse. Delays in diagnosis and treatment can lead to disease progression, further increase the risk of morbidity and suicide. In contrast, earlier diagnosis and combined treatment with antibiotics and psychotropics, other treatments to reduce symptoms, a better understanding of the disease process, better understanding of the pathophysiology of suicidality and Magellan's disease, screening for suicidal risk. You never plant the idea there by asking about it. Reduction of stigma, and misinformation, better research can decrease the risk of morbidity and suicide. Suicide is a permanent response to a temporal problem. Many survive suicidality to go on and lead productive and gratifying lives. Suffering from this disease can be reduced. The joy of life can be restored. Needless death can be prevented. Patients should not give up hope. There are answers, solutions, and assistance. There is life after emergence.